Okay, thank you very much. I will present what I call the quantum field theory of gravity, because as you very well know, uh, most approaches to quantum gravity assume that you have to leave quantum field theory to embrace radically different approaches like uh, string theory or loop quantum gravity or um, ADS-CFT holography. And uh, I've never really been convinced by their arguments and I've always thought that quantum field theory was well equipped with the tools to solve this problem and that the right path was to depart as little as possible from the standard model of particle physics, which has been so successful so far. So I will present this theory, which does require a new notion, the notion of purely virtual particle, because you have to expect that uh, if you want to study quantum gravity, you need to renounce something or to introduce something new to understand the nature of space and time at very, very small distances. But apart from that, it's uh, just one step uh, further along the same path that led to the standard model of particle physics. And uh, one uh, recent uh, outcome is that this theory can be uh, falsified or confirmed in our lifetime, thank you, thanks to primordial cosmology. So in the last part of the talk, I will describe how to treat purely virtual particles in uh, cosmology. So um, let's start from the Fermi theory of weak interactions, which is a non-renormalizable theory, the first theory that uh, could describe the weak interactions. It is based on a vertex that contains four fermions, and uh, it is multiplied by a constant, the Fermi constant, which is of dimension minus two in units of mass. And so the theory is non-renormalizable. A way to make it renormalizable was to introduce intermediate bosons and so turn uh, those vertices into tree diagrams, basically, built with a different basic vertex in which you have a dimensionless coupling. And in the standard model of particle physics, we very well know that all gauge couplings are dimensionless. Now, uh, you might also know that uh, Young and Mies proposed their theories in 1954. But those theories were not able at that time to give account of the masses of the intermediate bosons because being gauge theories, they had massless uh, fields. And so it took almost 20 years to appreciate how important Young and Mies theories were and uh, uh, then they became so important for two reasons. One is the spontaneous symmetry breaking mechanism, which solved precisely this problem. And then it can generate the Fermi constant in the low energy limit. And the other one, the other breakthrough is asymptotic freedom. Now, you might think of gravity as something similar from the point of view of quantum field theory. If you quantize the Hilbert-Einstein action, or any effective field theory that you may obtain by adding higher curvature terms to the Hilbert term, like R squared in the Starobinsky theory of inflation, or many others, and you expand around flat space, then you have many vertices with an arbitrary number of external gravitons. And uh, if you compute the dimension of the coupling constant in units of mass, it's exactly like the Fermi constant, minus two. Now, the problem of renormalizability, of non-renormalizability in this case, can be uh, solved by introducing, again, some intermediate bosons, massive bosons. And we will see, however, that we need a, a boson of a new type, which will uh, be called phacon. Let's say this is a fake particle uh, or a purely virtual one. Again, if you do that, 
you will obtain a theory with a gauge coupling that is dimensionless, precisely like all the gauge couplings of a standard model. However, if you do this trick naively and you uh, try to solve the renormalizability problem, the first thing that comes to mind is to introduce some intermediate massive particles that turn out to be ghosts. And this is where people got stuck. Um, to turn them into phacons, it takes uh, some trick. And uh, the reason why you have to do that is that if you uh, don't do it, you will solve the non-renormalizability problem, but you will create a worse problem, which is the violation of unitarity. Basically, you will have something like negative cross-sections, negative probabilities negative numbers of particles. So if you want to gain renormalizability and not lose unitarity, then you need something radically new in between. So we will describe this. So the summary of the talk is like this. We will describe these uh, new uh, entities, the purely virtual particles, how they are uh, introduced by means of a quantization prescription that's alternative to the Feynman plus I epsilon prescription. And then we will see how uh, the quantum field theory of gravity can be built and its unicity. And then in the last part, we will derive predictions for primordial cosmology that can be tested. They are quite sharp, actually, quite sharp predictions that can be tested in uh, the next years, and the situation is very lucky because we don't even need to tell experimentalists what to look for because they are already doing it. They are measuring a quantity which is a ratio of two spectra of, of perturbative mm, perturbation spectra, R known, and uh, uh, the game here is to anticipate what they will find. Okay, so let me introduce what the basic idea behind a purely virtual particle is. Uh, you know that a particle can be real or virtual. It is real when it enters a detector and it is detected, and it is uh, virtual in all the rest of its life, basically. Inside diagram, it is virtual. Whenever a uh, wave function is not collapsed, it is virtual, and so on and so forth. Now, you cannot imagine a particle that's purely real, which means always classical. But something that nobody thought about and can be thought about is something that is purely virtual or purely quantum, which means an entity that can never collapse, that can never be uh, seen in a detector, but nonetheless uh, propagates inside Feynman diagrams. So it does not belong to the physical spectrum of asymptotic states, but it belongs to the set of virtual particles that propagate inside Feynman diagrams. So um, it must be introduced uh, and later projected away because you don't want it around. And uh, you have to show that this is consistent. In particular, you, you need to show that you can have unitarity. And if you want to have in mind something that in this respect is uh, similar to it, but in many other respects it is not, think of the fadeh popov ghosts. You introduce them in your theory to gauge fix the theory. And the good property is that thanks to this operation you can keep everything local. The action will be local. You will have nice Feynman diagrams nice Feynman rules to build the Feynman diagrams, but those are extra things that need to be projected away at the end. And you know that you can project them away consistently because there is a gauge principle uh, that allows you to prove theorems to all others. So the key idea is to reach the same goal or something similar with this new type of particle but without having a powerful symmetry principle that protects the entire construction. And that is possible thanks to a new quantization prescription for the poles of the free propagators, different from the 
Feynman i epsilon 1. And then you can prove that this is consistent to all others. So with this you will gain a theory of quantum gravity that is renormalizable and unitary. And uh, why is it so difficult? Because if you modify Einstein gravity by adding higher derivatives, for example, so instead of r you consider r plus r squared plus r mu nu r mu nu, then you gain renormalizability, but you have a propagator of this type with a polynomial of a higher degree in the denominator. And when you decompose it into simple poles, you will see that at least one of them has a minus sign in front. Then, when you quantize those poles with a Feynman prescription, you will have ghosts. You do not have ghosts no matter what. You have ghosts only when you use the Feynman i epsilon prescription. So we have to now discuss a little bit about unitarity and what it is and how to cure the basic problem due to this minus sign. Incidentally, let me tell you that uh, with the idea of Facons, you can cure this bad sign, but you cannot cure tachyons, for example. So the squared mass in the pose should always be positive or have a positive real part. This is a procedure that works for ghosts, but it doesn't work for tachyons or in more general situations. So what is unitarity? Unitarity is the statement that the S matrix, the scattering matrix, satisfies the unitarity condition S dagger S equal 1. And if you insert in and out states, you can write the formula this way, where you insert a completeness relation. So V is the space of physical states, N are the physical states, and then you have an identity like this one, where you see you have in states, you have out states, but you also have intermediate states. Now, this is what you would like to prove from a quantum field theory, and you can prove for phi to the fourth, QED, yang mis theories, the standard model. With higher derivative theories, you cannot prove such an equation if you use the Feynman prescription. Because what you will obtain due to the minus sign we have seen before is a pseudo-unitarity equation where instead of having intermediate states that are always multiplied by plus one, by a factor plus one, some are multiplied by plus one and some are multiplied by minus one. And this has to do with the sign in front of the simple poles when you decompose the higher derivative propagate. So you obtain something that holds in a bigger space, W, which contains physical particles and ghosts. And uh, you would like to project away the unwanted degrees of freedom, pretty much as you do with the fadeev popov ghosts. Now, it is not enough just to forget about them, because you can choose in and out states the way you like, and so you can choose them to be physical. But what you cannot choose is what appeared appears here in intermediate states, as intermediate states. So even if you forget about the bad degrees of freedom in the set of in and out states, they are generated back as intermediate states, unless, unless two things happen. One is you have a gauge symmetry principle that allows you to project away the Fadeipop of ghosts consistently also from the intermediate states. And this is what happens with gauge theories. The other possibility is the one I will describe in this talk. Namely, you have to uh, do something surgical inside Feynman diagrams, uh, inside them, to make this possible, because normally it is not. So um, it will be useful to rephrase these identities um, in a diagrammatic way, because this identity, the unitarity equation, is very nice, but it is a little bit cryptic. And even if uh, it, uh, it makes use of uh, initial and final states and intermediate states in the second form, 
here or here, uh, there is a much better and more efficient, more explicit way to express these uh, identities, which is diagrammatic, and then you know what happens. So basically, you can derive the so-called optical theorem, and in these are the two simplest cases we'll, we'll, which we will use. And in one case, you have a tree diagram like this, very simple, and in the other case, you have a bubble diagram, and uh, the theorem tells you that the imaginary part of the amplitude is a cross-section. It's positive in particular. It, it becomes from S dagger S, which is uh, positive. So you cannot have uh, minus signs around. Minus signs are very dangerous because if you change the sign in front of a propagator here, you multiply everything by minus one and you will have a minus in front of a cross-section. Okay. So uh, the optical theorem is what you violate when you have these kind of ghosts. And another important thing, uh, the meaning of physical meaning of uh, this imaginary part is that you see the virtual particles in green that circulate into the bubble become real in the right hand side. They are produced and uh, so basically the theorem tells you that there is some information inside the bubble diagram which concerns a physical process where the virtual particles become real. They become out states. So if you want the green object to be purely virtual, this should be zero. And you have to change something inside the diagram to make it possible. Being zero is not in contradiction with unitarity, because what is in contradiction is a minus sign or uh, a negative thing, but not zero. So a, physical, um, a purely virtual particle is something like a zero particle. Uh, let me see, let me describe it more explicitly now, moving to the propagators. So let's consider a an unprescribed propagator, 1 divided by p squared minus m squared. And let's put both signs in front because we want to discuss both possibilities. What is a particle or a ghost? Well, you have to use the Feynman prescription plus i epsilon. And then you have to check what the imaginary part of the propagator is because of this identity. The imaginary part should be something with a definite sign because it has a um, physical meaning as a cross-section for the production of the virtual particle that becomes real. Now, if you use distributions, you can easily check that the Feynman propagator has a, an imaginary part that is the delta function on shell. That is the particle. But the delta function is multiplied by plus if the residue of the pole is plus. It's multiplied by minus if the residue is minus. So a physical particle is like saying you have a plus one pl particle. That means one particle. A ghost is like saying you have a minus one particle, which is absurd. Or you will have minus negative cross sections or negative probabilities. You can rephrase the problem in many ways, but it will not disappear. So the first thing you can think of to make this delta function disappear because you want something purely virtual is to take the average of Feynman and anti-Feynman. Because on shell, there is no delta function. This uh, the, has an imaginary part that irrespectively of the sign in front is zero times delta function on shell, so it is zero. Now, for some uh, reasons, I will call, um, okay, uh, this propagator is, however, not very good uh, in Feynman diagrams. And it has never been considered for a reason, probably, because it is very dangerous. It's not nice uh, to mix two opposite prescriptions in the same Feynman diagram, and we will see why. And uh, the crucial thing is that if you want to define this purely virtual entity, you have to remember that it is purely quantum and it's not 
reachable by quantizing something classical. You have to plunge into the Feynman diagrams and directly there look for the right idea. Because if you take something classical like this one and you quantize it, you calculate Feynman diagrams as you would normally do, you will run into a huge number of problems. So you will have to be very cautious here and do something that I will describe now. Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. So uh, the, the price you will pay by doing this will be that you will violate micro-causality. There is a uh, violation of causality in, uh, um, since these are massive fields and the mass is very large, I can hear a bell. Can one turn off the microphone? Thank you. So uh, the theory will violate micro-causality and that is the only, um, less, not, it's not even a price to pay because micro-causality is a very, very weak uh, principle that already in the standard model um, is not uh, firmly defined and there is no um, um, accepted definition of causality for quantum field theory. So you might remember of the Lehmann-Zimmermann-Simansic requirement that fields should commute at space-like separated points or the Bogolyubo definition. But those definitions of causality in quantum field theory are not directly related to physical quantities. S matrix amplitude. They are off-shell or operators, commutation of operators, and uh, so that's a tricky con consequence, uh, concept. But, the, but you're right, the consequence will be this, that at very high energies, you will have to renounce, renounce not only actually the notion of causality, but at very high, high energies, you will have to renounce the notions of time and coordinates, okay, because there will be just parameters in your theory with not a clear physical meaning, and you will have to rely on energies and momenta. So momentum space will be privileged. Pretty much like at large distances instead, coordinates are somewhat privileged. Because if you want to describe a black hole, for example, you would never do it in a, a momentum space. Okay, so we compare three uh, calculations of the di uh, bubble diagram with the Feynman prescription, which is the usual one, two Feynman particles. Then I will compare, uh, uh, we'll also discuss the naive way of treating this combination Feynman plus anti-Feynman, which I will call Feynman-Wheeler, because there have been uh, long ago a uh, theory proposed by Feynman Wheeler, which was only classical, in which uh, this uh, combination appeared. I'm sure that it appeared in many other contexts before, and Feynman and Wheeler never meant it for quantum field theory, so, so this is just a name to, to understand each other. And then we will see the difference with the Facon prescription. So the diagram is the bubble, but instead of having two Feynman propagators, we'll have Feynman and then Feynman-Wheeler, which is one half Feynman plus anti-Feynman. And in the third case, we will have Feynman and one Facon, which is something uh, which we will define in a moment. So basically, you have to treat this integral with one propagator with I epsilon and another propagator with minus I epsilon. What happens in the usual Feynman case? Feynman-Feynman is very easy. You integrate by means of Feynman parameters. You have this formula. The I epsilon prescription goes there. And if you plot the analytic structure of the result of this integral, you will see that when you complexify the external momentum P, or to simplify the energy P0, you will have two branch cuts in the real axis and two branch points that correspond to the threshold precisely for the production of the physical particles in the middle. As you see here, you have an incoming particle 
that can produce the two virtual particles as real particles. And this can happen only when the incoming particle has an invariant mass that is bigger than the sum, of course, of the two masses of the products. And this is the threshold. This is where the violation of analyticity begins here. And the violation of analyticity means that you have a discontinuity in the amplitude from above and from below, an imaginary part, and that is precisely where what is captured by this identity. The imaginary part of the amplitude is equal to something positive, which is the cross-section for the production of those particles that are turned from virtual to real. OK, so this is the structure. Now, it is much simpler to describe first what happens in the FACON prescription, because in this I've chosen a very simple case where you can skip many, many uh, details and get to the basic ideas uh, without uh, the burdening of uh, uh, lengthy calculations. This propagator is much more involved, and I will mention later what happens and, what is, and why it is so bad. So basically, let's consider the case where inside the bubble you have one Feynman propagator and one Facon. Whatever it is, it is defined by these rules that I tell you now. You start again from the Euclidean version of the diagram, which means that axis. In the Euclidean version, you will still have this integral. You can drop i epsilon because uh, p squared is uh, Euclidean. And uh, so there is no difference between Feynman Feynman and Feynman Fake. Now, you initiate the Vic rotation from Euclidean to Miskowski. The Feynman prescription corresponds to end the Vic rotation analytically. And that means that you will get to this part of the real axis from above and to this part from below. That's the Feynman prescription. If instead you do the contrary, you get the conjugate amplitude, which is the one that goes into S dagger. OK, so the Feynman prescription basically tells you, and this is well known, to perform the Vic rotation analytically. It is an analytic operation. You calculated your function in an open set here, for example, then you know it everywhere in the complex plane. You know it everywhere. And you have to tell me what is the value on the real axis, because the real axis is the physical axis. And you have two values here, one from above and one from below. Feynman tells you, you pick the one from above. Facon tells you, you pick the average of the two. And that's it. In this simple case, that's what you have to do. So in formulas, instead of having this object, you can average the, the two cases with minus and plus i epsilon. And it is equivalent to drop i epsilon in the integrand, in the argument of the logarithm. But since the argument of the logarithm can be positive or negative, and it should be always positive, you square it, you square it, and you divide by 2. And that's it. If you plot the result, you will see that the threshold corresponds to a clear violation of analyticity in the real part. In the imaginary part, you have Feynman goes like this. Feynman is zero, no production of virtual particles into real, because you are below the threshold. And then you start to produce them. Facon Facon is, or Feynman Facon is always zero, so you have no production of these particles, which is why they are called fake particles. And then you can consistently project them away. So this is the reason why you can forget them uh, from the initial, from the final states here, you can replace this multiplied by zero, because they are not in the out states. But this is possible if you want to keep this identity only because you have changed something in the calculation of the bubble, because otherwise 
they would be regenerated inside as virtual particles that become real. A couple of words about Feynman Wheeler, because uh, I, I leave it for last because it's much more complicated, but this is the natural thing you would do if you would quantize this kind of uh, propagator. What's the difference? The basic difference is as follows. When you, oh no, let's go move on. The, when you compute the usual bubble, you can start from the Euclidean and make the Vic rotation, or you can compute directly Minkowski. Well, once you change a plus i epsilon or minus i epsilon into plus i epsilon, you are mirroring some poles of some propagator with respect to the real axis, like this. So you will have some poles in the first and third quadrant. And you understand very well that now the Vic rotation will find an obstacle, which is this. So it is not the same to calculate something in Euclidean and rotate, or calculate something directly in Minkowski. It will give different physics. That's precisely the difference here. So if you want to study the Feynman-Wheeler thing, you will have to compute things directly in Minkowski. Um, what happens there? It just go through very quickly because it's a simple exercise, but quite annoying from the technical point of view. You have those two propagators, one with the wrong sign, minus i epsilon. You cannot use Feynman diagrams with plus and minus. You have to reverse the sign of one propagator in, in order to have both pluses. So you collect a minus sign in front and you change the sign in front of these. Then you can use the Feynman parameters, but at this point you will have a messy calculation to make. And to make a long story short, you will run into all sorts of very, very bad problems. For example, the first thing is that the divergent part, lambda is a cutoff, is non local. 1 divided by p squared is a, is a cutoff log of the cutoff multiplied by a very ugly non polynomial function of the external momentum. So, what you find is as follows. Let's compare the three cases. As far as renormalizability and locality are concerned, the divergent parts are the same for Feynman and Facon, and they are local. Why are they the same? Because they come both from the Euclidean, and only the end of the Vic rotation is different. And once you renormalize the theory in the Euclidean, you can end the Vic rotation the way you want. But if you Vic rotate something, that's convergent, you will always obtain something convergent. Instead, in the Feynman-Wheeler case, you find something non-local, and that uh, violates the locality of counterterms, the locality of the theory, and renormalizability. But there is some more upsetting things that happen with this Feynman-Wheeler. The threshold will no longer be the, the one you had in Feynman-Feynman or Feynman-Fake, but you will find a, different of, a difference of masses. So you have physical processes where some initial mass m can decay into two particles of masses m1 and minus m2. So basically a particle of 1 GV can decay in a particle of 10 GV and another one of 11 GV as long as the difference is 1. And that is, uh, uh, violates stability. And then if you want to check whether the processes corresponding to these thresholds really take place, you have to compute, by the optical theorem, the imaginary part of the amplitude or the discontinuity. And if you do that, the imaginary part of the amplitude is some complicated factor, forget about it, times what? Times a theta function for Feynman Feynman that tells you that you are precisely above the threshold the right threshold, times a different theta function in Feynman-Wheeler, which tells you that you are below the wrong threshold, and times zero in the Facon case, which means that the physical process does not occur. Namely, it is a fake process, and you can project the 
degrees of freedom away from your physical spectrum. Okay, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about, about the story of this because I have already presented the thing in the, the nicest possible way to make it, to communicate it. At the beginning, uh, it was a little bit more difficult and uh, um, technically, and uh, the uh, investigation began from the study of the Levick models. So I want also to make a comparison between this and the idea, ideas of Lee and Vick. Lee, uh, the Lee and Vick models, uh, I thought, were... Uh, Lee and Vick claimed they could make sense of higher derivative theories. And that's why they were interesting for... Uh, possibly for quantum gravity. Uh, but initially, I did, did not think it was possible to make sense of uh, higher derivative theories at all. So the purpose was to disprove them. Actually, it turns out that the Liebig models uh, have some issues and the formulation is not uh, complete. Uh, others try to make it right, but they remain ambiguous. Well, in the end, uh, what were I uh, found with Marco Piva uh, is that they need to be completely reformulated. And uh, after the, reformulate, the reformulation, it uh, turns out that uh, they are very different from what uh, Lee and Vick intended. And so uh, they are the cornerstones for the ideas I told you before. Uh, but uh, the result is uh, different in uh, at least two major uh, things. One thing that uh, Lee and Vick never intended is to get rid of uh, degrees of freedom. Um, and uh, more the ap approach was more like you have some ghosts. If you arrange the ghost into pairs, suitable pairs, uh, then they can decay. And uh, you can live with ghosts, pretty much like Hawking and Ertog said, in the sense that since they decay, they are unstable, so you can neglect them, ignore them in the final states. So their purpose was never to eradicate those things or other things, like the Facons, completely for, from the theory. And uh, this is a, pro, a, a procedure or an approach I do not uh, uh, think is right. And the basic uh, Counter, counter argument for me is the muon because the muon is unstable and this is not a good reason to ignore it from the final and initial states you can have muons you just boost the muon so that it lives so long that it can enter your detector as a muon and exit the detector again as a muon then you have observed the muon so this is uh, the first thing that uh, People working in this um, business uh, probably did not uh, appreciate. But if you come from former quantum field theory, as I did, Fadei Popov, Batalin Vilkovsky, and all the, the stuff that you normally use to deal with those types of projections, then for me it was more natural to look for something like that. And another thing is that to make their uh, idea work, Lee and Vick had to assume that the poles were not on the real axis, like the ones we studied in the bubble so far, but they came into complex conjugate pairs, far away from the real axis with a finite width, which makes them decay, by the way. That's what makes them decay. But you cannot build uh, uh, gravity with those uh, kind of poles. Actually, you can, but you will need mm, too many higher derivatives. How many? Your choice. You will have um, infinitely many possibilities, super renormalizable gauge couplings, unlike the gauge couplings on the standard model. Well, it turns out that after the reformulation here, uh, it, all, it was possible to forget about many requirements that Lee and Vic thought were important, and even uh, treat poles on the real axis by means of the tools I told you uh, earlier. And uh, once you do that, you get to a unique theory of quantum gravity. 
To prove all other theorems, I have to tell you that, which you find in this paper, uh, you will still need to take poles on the real axis. You have to split them into pairs far away from the real axis, prove theorems, and then show that you can take the limit back to the real axis. Long story, but in the end, if you want to calculate things, you just use the recipe I told you earlier, which uh, already appeared in these papers, by the way, which, um, which I call average continuation. So this way to average two analytic continuation is a unambiguous non-analytic operation which associate an analytic function to an analytic function with an analytic function. So you have an analytic function in uh, the Euclidean region and then you can define the value, the, the amplitude in the cut, inside the cut, and it will still be analytic. But you will have two functions that are not analytically related, but non-analytically related this way. The violation of analyticity is associated with the violation of causality, of microcausality that we mentioned earlier. Okay, normally the violation of analyticity is associated with the physical production of the particles in the Feynman case uh, by the optical theorem. In this case, there is no physical production of the particles and the only remnant that you get is a violation of microcausality. Okay. So uh, the theory then is this one. The same as uh, action as considered by Steller when he proved that higher derivative gravity is normalizable in 77, R plus Y squared plus R squared. The main difference is that Steller, of course, used the Feynman prescription for all the degrees of freedom, and then you have a theory with ghosts. Once you uh, use the Facon prescription for only one degree of freedom, which is the one associated with pi squared, you have a different physics, different uh, imaginary paths, different cross sections, and even a different classical action, because let me stress it very clearly, this is not a good classical action. Although I'm using it to define quantum gravity, this is not a good classical limit. Why? because it has higher derivatives, and higher derivatives are bad for um, a classical theory. So what do you do normally if you have ghosts? If you have ghosts, you have the problem classically also. But in my case, this is an unprojected action. It's not the projected. It's not the final classical action, because there is something here the phacon that needs to be thrown out of the, in the same way as in quantum field theory, it is thrown out of the in and out states. It has to be thrown out classically as well, in a way that we will describe in a moment. Okay, so let me mention a couple of properties here. Uh, yes, what is important here is that you have to think of this action pretty much like the gauge fixed action with the Fadeev Popov ghosts, you know. You, it's a classical action. You quantize the classical gauge fixed action, but you do not treat the gauge fixed action as a true classical action. You first project away the ghosts, which means you kill them. In that case, the projection is very simple. So here the theory the true classical theory can be obtained by classicizing the prescription I gave you before for Feynman diagrams. And as I told you, since this is uh, uh, this phacon is purely quantum, you cannot obtain it by quantizing something classical, but you can obtain the classical limit by classicizing the, the, the outcome. And this is what allows us to do some, some cosmology, by the way, because cosmology will have to use this action and quantize it in the sense of quantum mechanics. We do not need loops, so it will be much, much simpler. So to summarize, in quantum gravity, you, uh, this theory, so by the way, this theory is unique, I stress it again, because it is the unique one where the um, gauge coupling of gravity 
by the power counting of this theory is dimensionless, precisely like all the other gauge interactions of the standard model. But if you wanted super normalizable theories, then you would have infinitely many possibilities. It's a different class. And this theory propagates the graviton, which is the fluctuation of the matrix around flat space. This is massless, of course. Then you have a massive scalar field, which is the inflaton, and it corresponds to R squared, basically. And then you have the spin 2. That's the dangerous one, corresponds to Weil squared. And if you study the pole of, the, of its propagator, it will have a crucial minus one in front, which forces you to quantize it as a phacon. It has spin two, it has mass, and so um, you will have a violation of microcausality at energies larger than its mass. Its mass, by the way, is the only new free parameter of this theory. Because this theory contains, well, the cosmological constant, which is suppressed here because in cosmology you normally can deal with it without introducing it. Then you have Newton's constant, G. Then you have M phi. And then you have M chi. Cosmological constant and the Newton constant are known. M phi can be derived from the spectrum of the scalar fluctuations in primordial cosmology. And it is 10 to the 13 GV. And on M chi, well, we have something to say, uh, abound at least. It cannot be completely free, but it will anyway be uh, determined when uh, cosmologists, I mean uh, experimentalists, will measure the tensor to scalar ratio R. So now I move to cosmology in the final part of the talk. Okay. If you want instead to pursue the quantum field theoretical side and uh, check beta functions, the renormalization widths, absorptive parts, checks of the optical theorem, and um, violations of microcausality, then you can uh, uh, check these two papers. So, okay, what do you do when you want to study cosmology, inflation in particular? Well, you have to uh, study this theory, and as I said, for the moment, uh, let's, uh, we will have to project away something. Uh, so for the moment, we, are, we study this knowing that it is not the right classical theory. Well, there is one way to make it simpler, which is make a conformal uh, field redefinition in order to get rid of R squared and introduce explicitly the scalar phi of which m phi is the mass. So I don't know if you are familiar with it, but basically that action is equivalent to this action, where you have the Hilbert term and Weil squared term are modified, but instead of R squared, you have a Starobinsky potential for a scalar, and the mass m phi is precisely the mass of a scalar. And when you study cosmology, you study the Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker background. And the good thing of the Weil squared term is that it does not disturb the Friedman equations of the background because they are Weil invariant. That's the basic reason. And this is Weil squared. So the field equations will be solved by the usual inflationary um, quantities uh, A and phi, and the scalar phi and the Hubble parameter, A dot divided by A. Now, since I, I am coming uh, from high energy physics and I'm used to try and rephrase everything in the language of high energy physics, we can tell you that uh, if you introduce this coupling alpha, the, uh, these equations can be rephrased in a very nice way as a beta function for a renormalization group flow, which is not a renormalization group flow for uh, radiative corrections here. It's just the same equations that you see here, but just written in a in a funny, different way. So basically, by manipulating the, those equations, 
and introducing what's known as conformal time, you will see that those equations can be written in the form of a beta function that starts like the QCD one. You can expand it to arbitrary orders in alpha, but it's a nice thing is that it can, it's very similar to the ones of uh, quantum field theory, so you can use all knowledge you have from quantum field theory, leading logs, resummation of leading logs. You can prove that uh, the spectra satisfy color semantic equations. So let me plot here the beta functions, like the QCD one here. And if you are curious to know what, what happens there, if there is another fixed point or not, since we have it exactly here, this is, we can integrate these equations numerically. I can show you the beta function exactly. This is it. Changing variables to an arcosine. This is an oscillating behavior that corresponds to the reheating phase. And uh, if you take this potential, the Starobinsky potential, and you plot it, it goes like this. It's, there is a slow roll region and a minimum. And you can use the perturbative beta function here where there is a slow roll. And then your scalar phi will go down and start oscillating. And the oscillations will be damped till it will stop in the minimum at time plus infinity. And this is what you see in the beta function, oscillation like that, damped oscillation, but no other fixed point. Okay, this uh, uh, region, the non-perturbative one, is not of our concern now. We just uh, express the spectra in the uh, slow roll region where the beta function is approximately like the one of QCD. And so you can you integrate the beta function to write a running coupling to the leading log order. K is the momentum of uh, fluctuations. Here K is just the parameter, but it will be a momentum. And uh, you will see that the spectra, which are the two-point functions of the uh, fluctuations, of the quantum fluctuations around the background metric, the spectra will satisfy a Kalanski Masic equation, basically. Namely, instead of depending on momenta, on the momentum of the fluctuation uh, in an arbitrary way, it depends on it only inside the running coupling that you obtain by solving this, by integrating this beta function. Okay, now I give you some results and some predictions just to, to flash them, and later I will tell you how to get them, namely how to use this action and project away, make the projection of the FACON uh, in order to get those uh, results. So uh, the calculations have been pushed to high orders already, and um, 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 if you are familiar with the data collected by Planck, they are normally expressed with reference to a pivot scale, which is 0 0.05 megaparsec to the minus 1. And there, when you measure the spectrum of the scalar fluctuations, the phi fluctuations, you can uh, take their data and find the value of the running coupling there. Basically, it's 1 divided by 115. So this expansion has a fine structure constant, which is similar to the one of QED. Instead of 1 divided by 137, you have 1 divided by 115. And then you can run the coupling to the momentum you want. And compute the spectra. OK, so these are uh, just to give you an idea of uh, the formulas. PR is the scalar two-point function, and PT means the tensor spectrum. Tensor means graviton, the graviton two-point function. And just to show you that they are functions of the running coupling, alpha and nothing else, all the rest are coefficients that depend, however, on the phacon everywhere, because through the mass, m chi, of the phacon. This psi is the ratio of the two masses, squared, 
this zeta is just a, a denominator that I want to not be bothered by. Uh, so I define this zeta. But you see that in the expansion you have a zeta here, which contains the mass of the phacon, a zeta in the first order, all orders, for the tensors, but not for the scalars. No phacon here, no phacon here, only there. So basically, since so far only the scalar fluctuations have been measured, we have not seen the graviton, which is this. And as soon as you will see it, we will also see the effects of the phacon already at the zeroth order. Let me plot the, the predictions. Maybe. Um, okay, let me skip this. So, um, one uh, prediction is this uh, ratio, R, which is the ratio of the two spectra. And since it depends on the tensors, it will be affected by the phacon even to zeroth order. Now, people tell us that they will measure R in the next years. And the prediction here is that it will be in this tiny window, which is constrained as follows. Uh, these two vertical lines are bounds coming from the um, data on uh, the um, measurements that have already been made. And the curved lines instead are the bounds coming from two limits that are, one is infinitely heavy phacon, which reduces to the Starobinsky theory, r plus r squared, so no vi squared. And the other one is more interesting because it was found in this paper with Bianchi and Piva, because it comes directly by making, by requiring that you can make the phacon projection that I will describe in a moment to close the, the talk. Namely, you find that you cannot give sense to this procedure on a curved background, because scattering processes are in flat space. Here we are on a curved background that's more tri non-trivial. Unless, you cannot make sense of it unless the mass of chi is bigger than the mass of phi divided by four. And the data we have on from the spectra already measured tell us, as I told you before, that m phi is something like 10 to the 13 GV. So m chi should be heavy as well. So in the end, you have uh, that for a typical value inside here. Uh, the prediction is that R is between 3 thousandths and 0.4 thousandths. If it will be here or here, it will be very bad for the theory. So the theory is falsifiable, and that's a good thing. Because in cosmology, otherwise, you have many, many models that can move this R wherever you want. And basically, you cannot predict too much unless you have uh, these uh, constraints that come from high energy physics. So, for example, in yellow here in this background, you see uh, this is taken from Planck. This is the scalar spectrum, PR, as a function of the momentum. And uh, since I have uh, a running coupling, I can compute something beyond what has been observed. So what has been observed is basically a straight line, and the predictions are in complete agreement with a straight line. But if you want to add the effect of the running coupling, then you will see a, sm a slight uh, departure from a, sl a straight line here. If you zoom this square, you have a very tiny effect. So to see this effect, you will need precision measurements. So let's hope that people will get to those. And this is, the graph is just to emphasize more the, the running. So let me tell you very briefly to conclude how to compute these things. And I will do it for the tensor spectrum and not the scalar one because it's much easier. It's a tensor, you can think it's more heavy. Computations are more heavy, but conceptually, and formulas are more heavy, contain many more terms, but the, 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 the conceptual derivation is much, much simpler. So for example, you can forget about the scalar. The action you need is this, 
but remember again this is unprojected so the crucial thing I want to tell you is how to project to treat this so what you do is you take your metric you expand around Friedman Robbins or Volker Lemet and these are the fluctuations with the two tensor modes spin 2 and you expand the Lagrangian to the quadratic order you will have two parts the usual one and the correction due to the fake and the usual one is treated in a very simple way because it's very simple you see and you can uh, derive the so-called mukano sasaki equation and the spectrum of the fluctuations directly with few steps well so how to treat higher derivatives with the phacon it looks complicated and it is the formulas are heavy but the, the concept is very simple so first of all you eliminate the higher derivatives by introducing an auxiliary field an extra field u capital u for example and this is done with a trick you add a zero basically you add the square the square of u minus something so you are adding the square of u minus something and the field equation of u will be u equal something so you are adding a zero on shell and then you have a, a, a Lagrangian that has no higher derivatives you eliminate this u dot dot from here and there with this trick then you have two scalars only with simple derivatives and then you uh, make a simple change of variables to diagonalize it in the De Sitter limit what is the De Sitter limit? it is the limit where this uh, background becomes De Sitter where A is equal to the exponential of the Hubble constant times T and H is really a constant during inflation H is not a constant and, uh, but in this limit which is the limit of zero coupling which is the fixed point around which we are expanding it's a very lucky situation actually to, to find that you can diagonalize this, uh, these two degrees of freedom in that limit but you can and so you will have an action with two new degrees of freedom capital U and capital V the action looks complicated it's here but again it's not so complicated for example in the De Sitter limit alpha going to zero alpha zero look what you get alpha zero you have the usual action you had always plus another one for the second degree of freedom with the wrong sign you see this is the phaco so how to get rid of the phaco you solve its own field equation with the phaco prescription and you insert the solution back and that's it what is the phaco prescription it is the classicization of the prescription I described earlier in loops okay this is um, simpler so basically what happens is that even if this is a classical action the, the, you do not have a degree of freedom V because when you solve the field equation of V you are not allowed to choose initial conditions or final conditions or boundary conditions you just have to solve it with the green function that's fixed from the prescription and which is the average of uh, retarded and advanced potentials basically and so you do it and you find a unique solution you can expand it and then uh, you will have uh, a, a, an equation for just one variable which is known uh, well it's a generalization of course it's more complicated but uh, I will call it the same name as it is called usually which is Mukano Sasaki and then you solve it perturbatively in this running coupling it's a long uh, story but uh, then you go back from uh, this uh, the variable that allows you to solve the Mukano Sasaki equation you solve it exp exp by expansion you go back to capital U with the phacon projection you find capital V which is a function of capital U by the projection you go back from to the um, change of variables that diagonalized so you go back to small u and when you have small u you have the two-point function 
and that is uh, the spectrum that I gave you. Okay, so the, the detour is much uh, more involved, but basically the point is that you have a prescription to treat um, these new particles both at the classical uh, limit, in the classical limit, but most of all at the quantum level, because without that you wouldn't be able to infer the classical limit. So to conclude, uh, the constraints of high energy physics play an important role here, locality, renormalizability, in, and unitarity, because they offer a unique theory, and it is a quantum field theory. It is predictive because it has only one parameter more than the Einstein, two parameters more than the Einstein theory, and one more than the Starobinsky theory. Constraints coming from cosmology, like the bound on the mass of the phacon, make the predictions already very sharp for the quantity r that should be measured in some years. So let's hope it will fall exactly in this tiny window. And then I wanted to show you, even if I didn't go into details, that you can make calculations. This was not obvious months ago when we started looking at cosmology because uh, uh, now it is much easier after the work has been done to understand what to do uh, in which order, but it was a very tough thing to do. And my hope is that primordial cosmology will develop also from the experimental point of view, because we need more precision than the one of the experiments that are today on their way to uh, detect and confirm these predictions. But uh, who knows? I spoke to some experimentalists, and some of them are optimistic, and maybe one day uh, primordial cosmology will be a, uh, an arena for precision tests of quantum gravity. Thank you very much.